Well, hello, welcome once again to Pale Blooms and Beyond. Thank you for joining us today. This is actually the first time I'm really at a loss for words to describe or give an intro to a band or musician. I'm not gonna to try to say the coolest, most creative things to wow the viewer with how much the music Mark Burgess and the Chameleons has meant to me over the years. Words can't and won't do either justice. If you're already familiar with the Chameleons, then you already know. If you don't yet know the music or in the band, then you need to know. To say that the Chameleons are one of the most important and influential bands of the last 40 years is not far off the mark. And speaking of mark, my guest today is none other than frontman, singer, songwriter, bassist, and acoustic guitarist, Mark Burgess. Welcome, Mark. Hello. Hello. <laughs> what an intro. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I appreciate you uh, you meeting with me today. Uh, it's it's uh it's hard to believe next year will be the 40th anniversary of script. Yeah, I know. I don't I try not to count the years. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was I was just looking at that and when it came out and I'm like, man, you know, next yeah. year. Yeah, that's I know 40 years ago, yeah. Wow. Madness. Wow. Yeah, yeah. It, is, it really is. Um talk about your uh, childhood growing up in Manchester. Um it was great, really. I mean, as a, as, a, as a very small child, it was the 60s, which was a great time um, to be um, in England. Um, I mean, from the innocent point of view of a child, um, I really loved it. You know, I remember you know, I was around for steam trains and and really cool looking motor cars and um, yeah. and the beat and the beatles and um you know, Mersey beat and um football you know with george best and that was it was just a great a great time um i, I had a i really i my memories of being a child are really quite happy up until um school in the seventh in the seventies and then um yeah, not so great. Um, uh, but I was lucky. I was fortunate. I mean, as I say, you know, I was old. I was not so young that I, um, that I missed out on the Beatles and um, and and the um, all, you know the, all the, the whole sixties thing. And then we had you know fantastic um, um, pubescent years with. David Bowie and T Rex and Roxy Music and Slade and oh, <clears throat> Alice, wow. Alice Cooper and all that stuff. And um, Sparks were a big band for me as well at that time. Um, and then punk happens, you know, mm. and we have The Clash and the Sex Pistols. And <clears throat> so, I mean, you know, I mean, music's always been central. Yeah. Uh, right, right from the get go. I mean, even as a very small child, music was central to me. So, um, you know, mm. that's the kind of thing that, that I suppose that's um, defined my upbringing, really. It's defined by what bands were around at the time, you know. Sure. Do you, uh, you were, you were an only child. Uh, yeah. do, you, do you think in that, in a way that that helped fuel your imagination? Um, that's an interesting question, really. I don't know. Um, yeah, maybe, maybe, you know, because the alienation certainly does that I think yeah maybe um I, but I, you know I, I would have I wanted a brother or a sister an older brother or a sister but it just didn't happen you know it wasn't that way and um or a younger one either no, my parents yeah. just didn't have any more children so I mean it's possible yeah um certainly more time um a lot more, a lot, you know, certainly more alone time, and certainly that that accentuated that feeling of alienation that I've always had. So, yeah, probably. Yeah, well, there are there are themes of childhood and nostalgia weaving their way through your lyrics. Songs like childhood nostalgia, for example. So, uh, I think you look. Yeah, back. well, I think you know, 
you start off as a more free thinking and more original thinker um, until the institutions kind of right. chase that out of you. Right. And, um, you know, that's where, where it all started to go wrong for me was, you know, it was like high school and stuff. Mm-hmm. But before, before that, um, you know, I do think I had more, I do think I was more open and more, more of a free thinker, you know, and I had more imagination. I was mad, but I didn't have any friends. So, so imagination was all I had, really. The only right. escape. Right. Yeah. And you I was were... very into, very into literature. And I was very into, um, you know, really unusual television shows and things that, that would fuel my imagination greatly as well. What, what TV shows do you recall? Um, very early, um, there were, t- there were, there were, there were two really very early on. There was the Jerry Anderson stuff, um, which was puppetry, um, which I found fascinating the models and the, pu- and the puppetry. Um, but the big show for me when I was a child was the prisoner. Um, oh, yeah. but I was, I, I really liked danger man. Um, I used to watch danger man religiously. I loved danger man because, um, didn't carry a gun. Right, uh, right. Danger Man was a, he was a spy, but he, he he didn't shoot people. He didn't carry a gun. And um, when that show ended, um, he started, you know, I, I I don't know how I learned of it, but he had a new show coming out called The Prisoner, which he'd actually I found out much later that he uh, wrote and produced as well. Mm-hmm. Um, and that was my favourite show at the age of six or seven years old eight years old um i really related to the character of number six and um it became very very influential um on me and my writing and stuff because i I totally identified with that idea of somebody completely cut off from everything and everyone while um these powers try to take away his individuality and his his free thinking and all of that stuff i I could i totally related to that with with regards with school in fact i used to walk down the corridors with a very enigmatic brooding expression and pull open the fire doors and make thunder and lightning sounds while i was doing it so to um eight the opening credits of the show um i never did get the lotus seven though Uh, is that right (laughs) yeah i i just i immediately threw that Giant ball, you know. Yeah, down, down. Was, that, yeah. That, I mean, that was a stroke of genius. But I mean, I had a phobia when I was a child of balloons. I hated them. There was a balloons around me. I had to burst them immediately. I couldn't have them. <laughs> I've now a rational explanation for that. I don't know why the existence of a balloon freaked me out so much. But I would have to burst them and get them away. You know, kill them. <laughs> um, so the idea of a giant balloon with a mind of its own wandering around um, was probably the most. Um, scary thing they could have come up with for me right yeah i think it was very effective yeah because i had a phobia i had a phobia about them <laughs> after yeah. that I couldn't, I couldn't bear to have them near me balloons <laughs> um what what about um you mentioned a few a few, few bands that were influential can you remember the first single or album that you ever got the beatles um the album was uh, please please me it was given to me by my grandmother Mm-hmm. Uh, my na- my nana, um, my mother, my, my parent, my mother, not my father so much, but my pa- my mother was. She thought there was something wrong with me because um, by the age of um, three and a half or something, I wasn't I wasn't speaking English. Mm-hmm. Um, so she was kind of she thought I had some sort of brain problem, neurological problem, um, and then a young girl. Um, that was a trainee at the nursery because my, both my parents worked all day so um, I would be in kindergarten and uh, she came and she brought some uh, records in and she started playing me the records and she started teaching me to sing the songs and that's how I learned to speak English so um, it was Beatlemania it was 1963 so she was bringing all the Beatles records in so I learned to sing them all so my grandmother um on discovering this um had me singing um at the uh, christmas 
family party. And as a reward, she gave me uh, a copy of the first Beatles album. But it was a while before I had actually anything to play it on. I used to have to play it at my, at my grandmother's because she, she had a gramophone. She had one of those old um, valve um, radiogram things that had a radio and a, and a, and a record player on it. And you could smell the ozone when, it was, when the valves were warming up and stuff in the transformer. Um, and she had that, so I'd play it on that. And it, well, I didn't get, um, I think I was about seven before I got my first record player, which was a Dan set, mm -hmm. Dan set record player. And um, that's when I started buying my own records at, at the age of seven. But um, yeah, that was the first one. Yeah, yeah. You mentioned some of the, the, uh, <clears throat> the bands that were influential. A lot of the glam bands were, were there any yeah. other uh, groups that you were into as a, as a teen? Um, there was a lot that I liked, but the ones that I were passionate about really was, I think, T-Rex first and foremost. It took me a while to get into Bowie because it, it, it seemed it seemed quite... I was into out and out rock and roll bands. Um, right. You know, like Beatles were a rock and roll band. And, um, you know, that's what I was kind of into. The pantomime element of it, it took a while. So initially with Bowie, I thought, I thought, I thought he was too pantomime you know mm -hmm. uh, I was out to say I mean I love Mick Ronson I think Mick right. Ronson was the thing that got me into Bowie because I heard started listening to his solos on um, on Bowie songs and just went well wow you know and I got really really into Mick Ronson right. so that's how I got into David Bowie then I think it was around about I think it was about Aladdin Insane by the time I really started getting Deeply into Bowie's about Aladdin Sane. And it was down, it was purely down to Mick Ronson's guitar. Um, so there's T-Rex. I like Sparks because of the originality. I'd never heard the band that original. Um, and he's got like, you know, Russell's got one of those voices. You either love it or you hate it. There's no kind of in between, you know, you either <laughs> right. absolutely detest the style. I mean, not so much these days, but certainly back then at the beginning in the first few albums. But I loved it. I, I actually um, God, this keeps falling out. I actually uh, followed them around the northwest, the north northwest of England, um, when I was about fourteen to to watch them, like lying to my parents about where I was staying, and then just like <laughs> bagging lifts around the northwest to uh, to see Sparks. Um, there's a lot, but like I say, there's a lot of lot of stuff, a massive amount of stuff that I liked. Um, like through the 60s, you know, it was everything really that my, that my grandmother's, um, well, my uncles, you know, the youngest were the twins, and they were, I think they were still, they were, they were still living at home mm -hmm. at that point. They were still living at my nana's. I mean, all, you know, they were a big family. They were huge, and there's about eight of them all together one girl mm -hmm. and seven boys, I think. And, um, but the two twins were still there, and they'd been buying records. So I was listening to a lot of stuff. That they bought and, and records that my grandmother had, like she had Roy Orbison records, which I loved, and um, you know the guys had Beach Boys, um, like really old odd singles. Like I think the first actual first single I ever heard, the first record I ever heard, actually, I can't think of it, was Telstar by the Tornadoes. Ah, uh, okay. Um, yeah. My, my, grand, my, yeah. my, my, my uncle had a copy of, of it and um, I used to like those records, I used to like those like my, my, my father's brother Derek, he was the singer of the family actually, he mm -hmm. almost got picked up by Cliff Richards manager but he wouldn't have his teeth fixed oh okay uh, he needed cosmetic surgery on his teeth and he refused so <laughs> that didn't happen but he had, an, he had an, a really great a kind of operatic type voice, which my cousin Wayne inherited. Um, and he was buying, like, you know, uh, Adam Faith and Tommy Steele and all that stuff. Mm. So I was listening to that as well. The Shadows, man, I used to love the Shadows. Oh, yeah. Um, and a lot of the, a lot of the uh, Mersey Beach stuff searchers um, mm -hmm. were a big favourite of mine. Oh, great, um, yeah. yeah, really great. I loved that. That 12 string guitar they used to wheel out sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, and in the 70s, um, 
yeah, I mean, I didn't really get it. I, I didn't get Zeppelin until I was older. I mean, mm-hmm. at, at, the, at the time, I wasn't really into them or any of that heavier stuff like um, Deep Purple and Black Sabbath and all that. I, I, I didn't get into, I didn't really get any appreciation of that until I was quite a lot older. Um, mm-hmm. So for me, it was all um, the more progressive type of stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, I used to really like the Sensational Alex Harvey band. Oh. I mean, yeah. But you know that, which is paradox. It was a bit of a paradox, really, because they were very theatrical. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. By that time, I'd came to appreciate. <laughs> I became to appreciate the more theatrical aspects of rock, shall we say? Um, and I used to go. I mean, I used to go and watch Robin Shower and and people like that at the Free Trade Hall, just because I like going to the Free Trade Hall really more than the actual records. I, I just I just got to hear a lot of music. Um, and then I started about the age of 15, <clears throat> I was underage, but, um, I was going to a, a bikers club in Manchester called Waves, and um, I really, I really liked this band as a kid, and um, that because I used to listen to pirate radio station, but they never used to tell you who it was. Right? Uh-huh. Right, right. They, they'd play these records, but the, on the pirate radio stations, they wouldn't tell you who it was. Mm-hmm. And uh, I found out who, who, that this band that I'd really loved, and they didn't come figure out who it was, was The Doors. Oh, <laughs> so, terrible. so I was really into The Doors without even knowing it was The Doors for quite a long time. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, start, I started hanging out in this bikers club and stuff, and I, I started here in um, MC5 and. Um, New York Dolls and mm. all that stuff. Um, can you recall? Can you recall the first concert you went to? Yes, the first, very first concert I ever went to was T Rex. Okay. Um, in Manchester, but I saw. Um, I didn't see Ziggy, unfortunately. Like I was too late, as I couldn't get. A, I, this guy was supposed to get tickets and he didn't get them, so that was the last time he toured it. So I missed that. Uh, Dave and Regiment of that, but um, I saw Roxy Music, um, and I saw Queen when they were supporting um, not the Hoople. Oh, I saw Queen, I saw Queen as a support band. Um, oh, I really man. like Queen. I, I like Queen as well. I, I, would, um, have loved, I well, would have loved to have seen Mott the Hoople. Yeah, that would. That... Yeah, Mott the Hoople was fabulous. With Ariel Bender, absolutely fantastic. Um, but the very first show that I went, I bought my own ticket, and that it was 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 T Rex, yeah. T Rex, wow. Um, I, mean, I managed to see I managed to see T Rex about at least four or five times wow. after that. But the, that first time was at the height of T Rex, you know, it's right at the height of it, and uh, that was a, it was an incredible experience. <laughs> it was amazing, yeah, it was amazing. I think my ears my ears rang for about I couldn't really hit. There was my hairs were ringing for about three days. It was uh-huh. really great. It was great. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Um, They're the best rock and roll band I've ever seen to this day. To this yeah. day. Well, um, moving ahead just a little. Um, were the cliches your uh, first band? Yeah, kind of. I mean, I, it's hard to call it a band, really, because it, <laughs> it was more of a. It, it was like. It was a joke, actually. It was a joke. We were we were lampooning punk, and um, we never really we never got a drummer. We never really got a drummer, and um, our singer for that matter. Um, yeah, I mean that was that was the first time that I kind of entertained the notion of actually being in a band. Yeah, yeah. Um, I couldn't play a note when we formed the band. We formed the band first before we had. We we decided to go around spray painting the band's name or spray painting the band's name around town. Uh-huh. We just we went around with spray cans and we <laughs> sprayed the name of the band, but there wasn't actually we didn't actually have any instruments or anything. You know, uh-huh. we, had, we couldn't we couldn't play a note. Uh-huh. Um, and um, when we finally did get it together to get a couple of instruments and start learning, like, trying to learn how to play them, 
Um, we bumped into Dave and Reg, who'd been playing for quite a while. They had a, they had a pub rock band called Years. Years, right. And, uh, yeah, and I hadn't seen them for ages. And they were saying to me, like, what are you doing? And I said, oh, we found a band. I went, oh, right. So what's your band called? I said, it's called The Cliche. He says, oh, I've heard of them. I've heard of you. We hadn't played it. We hadn't played it out, and the reason was because we'd been around town spray paint, spray painting the name, of, spray painting the name everywhere. We'd promoted the band before there was actually a band. So, so well, it worked. It worked. It worked. Well, where are you? Are are you still in contact with uh, any any other guys from the cliches at all? Yeah. Well, there was only two of us. Anyway, um, it, we were a three-piece band when the drummer. When we the drummer dis, decided to turn up, which wasn't very often, um, <laughs> Ken, Ken, yeah, I mean Ken Grimes um, is in. He, he's actually in. I think he's in Hong Kong. He's still in Hong Kong. He's teaching in Hong Kong, but we've met. We've met up a few times. I remember we met up in New York, and uh, we were walking over the Brooklyn Bridge together, looking at Manhattan, going like, "Could you imagine?" Could you imagine that we would be doing this when we were doing the cliches and that? It was a really funny moment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I still see him. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, we'll, we'll jump ahead to uh, uh, start talking about Chameleon. Um, so, so, well, Tony Skinkiss, who's been with Chameleon, you know, he's been like, okay, he's been one of he's been one of us since day one, right? Since the Pill session, he maintains to this day that the cliches are the best band he's ever seen. Is that right? Yeah. Well, to each his own, right? I guess. Yeah. I can't get it. I don't get it, but that's what he says. He says, no, you. The best, best gig I ever went to was a cliche. All right. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I'll buy yeah. that. What? Yeah. Let's, let's just jump ahead to uh, Chameleons. Um, there's, a, there's an abundance of great songs on all the Chameleons releases, but to save space and time, I, I just want to address just a few mm -hmm. that, that happen to be special to myself and hopefully some of the some of the kind of you say that some of the some of the people watching some of the people. So um, I was fortunate with along with my brother to see you back in July at that private show, July 2nd, I believe it was, in yeah. Dallas. Yeah. And and you played Nathan's phase. Yeah. Which is one of my early favorite tracks. Uh -huh. And who is or was Nathan? John. Okay. Okay. Um, Nathan is actually an abbreviation of Jonathan. Oh, it is. Yeah. And, You're right. Um, and we, we were all we were all into we were, we were going through a very heavy pot smoking phase. Mm -hmm. And uh, but John like most things like he took it to extremes and he was he was rolling these huge joints that are about a foot long <laughs> and, uh, and smoking it and he was living very badly at the time he, he moved into this crazy house i don't think there was a straight wall in the whole house and um he was, he was like at this advertised house share thing so he moved into this house with this very grim collection of people <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, and he was eating slop and he was living on dehydrated pot noodle. Okay. And um, smoking these crazy, crazy foot long joints. <laughs> and um, yeah, it was going right downhill. And that's kind of, and it made me realize just how much pot I, I was smoking quite a lot of weed, but it didn't, you know, I had. I lived moderately well, you know. Um, I had a bit of sensibility about how I lived, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and uh, so I was able to handle it better. But when I realised, I kind of realised what it was doing. Like, well, you know, what you kind of you know, becoming a pothead can actually do, <laughs> can actually right. do, you know, um, the leth the lethargy and the and the and the the, the, the fucking lack of inertia. Um, I just decided. I just decided to like take it easy, but that's where that song came from. Yeah, Nathan's phase. Yeah, yeah, and the and the and the paranoia as well. You know, um, 
Well, you didn't get it in those days. I mean, there was no paranoia, actually. Um, mm -hmm. The smoke, the stuff we used to smoke was really mm -hmm. clean and mm -hmm. it wasn't like the fucking skunk weed that you get these days. It was like, it was proper, you know, sensimilia. Um, we didn't, you didn't make you paranoid. You didn't get paranoid. We didn't, I used to smoke loads of that um, stuff and never get paranoid. Um, it wasn't until later when they started putting chemicals or using chemicals in the uh, in the growing process that you started to get all the paranoia. Oh, uh, okay. Uh -huh. Wow, you you could write a whole uh, treatise on that treatise on <laughs> <laughs> the development and. <laughs> no, I should I just just um, that, you know, yeah. I mean, I've been around a while. <laughs> right. Well, um, let's let's. Um, Move to uh, 1983, mentioned earlier, next year will be 40 years, wow. Uh, saw the release of your first proper album, Script of the Bridge. Yeah. The album is my favorite, as well as many fans out there, I'm sure. In concert, you play a lot of the tracks off the album, except one that I've noticed uh, or haven't heard. And depending on my mood, it's one of my top two or three of Chameleon's all time, and that's View from a Hill. Um, in fact, I believe it's on the live performance uh, Camden Palace, live at Camden. Um, um, I, I, could, I couldn't yeah. tell you really. I, I don't, towards, I don't know. Towards, towards the end, I, I had to check with uh, my brother. You, you mentioned, you said, okay, we're gonna play View from a Hill, and there was no response. It may be some booze. I'm not sure, so you didn't play it. But you, oh, okay. but, but you brought it up, and uh, but that's that's uh, that was probably be the first song that uh, I was attracted to off of that album. I just Ooh. I just love that. Um, can, yeah, that's very yeah. I mean, it's, it's a very different um, for that on that record. It's a completely different dynamic. Um, I think it showed that we were songwriters, you know, not just you know. We were real proper songwriters. I think that's. I, I think what that demonstrates that song and demonstrated on that album. Um, you know, loads of people can get can get a tune together, especially post punk that early in post into post punk. You know, but writing actually writing songs, you know, is something else. And um, I think that showed that we could do it. I was very. I, that's my favorite on that album. Is that right? Okay. I think so. Yeah. 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 Well, I like second skin. Second skin's great, but um, yeah. There's something about View from the Hill that's really accomplished. You know. It really is. Yeah, I think so too. Did you? Uh, was there? A, was there a, a certain uh, place or um, area with the inspiration behind that song? Uh, behind the song? Um, no, no. Well. Yeah, I suppose so. Just just this place where we used to go when we were kids, uh, mm -hmm. where you could you could see the whole, um, it, like as the, as the city as the city of Manchester expanded outwards, got to this place, and it kind of went around it. And it's like a little park, and it and it's quite high up. So when you when you there's a cenotaph there as well, um, a war memorial. So if you stand there, you can see that like, you're surrounded by the city of Manchester right to the horizon. Okay. So if you go there at night, it's all, it's all neon, you know, as far as you can see in every direction. Mm -hmm. like you're in an, it's like being on an island surrounded by neon lights that go right to the horizon. And we used to go up there quite a lot. And um, so I suppose that's where I got I got, I I'm, I'm, I'm assuming that's where I got the song from. Um, when we, you know, the nights we used to go up there and just like look at, look at the stars and look at all these neon lights around us. Mm -hmm. wow. Well, um, you mentioned it's called, Tand can... it's called Tandall Hill. If anybody wants to find it, it's in, it's in, a, it's in a little town called uh, Right. It's called Tandall Hill. If you want to look at it on Google Maps, you can find it. Okay. Well, um, you mentioned Second Skin. Um, yeah. And that's one of my, again, top two to three favorite songs. But I think a lot of has already been said about this song, and I don't want to do, I don't want to do overkill. Um, yeah. I, want, I wanted to um, move on to um, ask you about this. 
the beginning of monkey land um the whirring sound how did you get how did you get that um it's like a piece of corrugated pipe mm -hmm. and um, you whirl it around and it makes that sound that they used to sell them in toy shops and um the very first time we ever went in the studio was in Cargo Studios in Muchdale. And they had one laying around, so we used it. And we, we loved it so much, we carried on using it. Um, I think it's on every record we've done, I think, in yeah. some degree, to some degree, on every album anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah it really, really yeah. stood out there. I, you know, you know, with all the, uh, you know, technology with keyboards and all that sense, you know, a lot of people probably think that's where it was, you know, emanated from, but it's interesting to hear, you know, you do something, you know, with a physical object like that to, to make yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Just a chance. Yeah. You wear it around over your head. You can still find them. Um, you can still find them. Oops, I think we're one more. Okay. Um, on your, uh, on your, on your uh, sophomore release, 1985's, What Does Anything Mean, basically? I love the intro. Silence, Sea, and Sky. I think it sets the tone for the entire album. Mm -hmm. Well, that's something David and Selena. Um, um, yeah, we did two or three times, I think, because he, he did it on the, at the end of Strange Times as well, where we just, we'd all come in and add little things and, and put little things on there and, you know, augment it. But essentially, that was Dave. Dave wrote it on Selena. Yeah, that that works. That works quite well there. Yeah, nice. I think I think you're noticing that I I like a lot of the more mellow, <laughs> uh, you know, tracks. I mean, I you know, second skin. I like the rockier ones as well too. But um, yeah. now off of this album, um, "Intrigue in Tangiers" was uh, the first song I was really attracted to that I really really picked up on. Tell the yeah. story. Tell the story of this song. Um. I don't know really what to tell you, actually. I mean, it, you know, we, it, it, came, it, it originated with Reg's um, opening riff, and mm -hmm. I just jammed around that, and so Dave came in later on with it. Um, uh, the theme of it I was came from visits to my grandfather, who was in a, by that time, he was in a, a home for ex-servicemen. Okay. Um, in the wars, various wars, Second World War, mainly at that time. It was not, there weren't that many survivors from the First World War. In the Second World War, um, and the Falklands War, I remember there was a few guys in there from the Falklands War. Um, but anyway, I used to go there and visit him, and I, I got talking to this guy in a wheelchair, he'd lost both his legs. He was actually a merchant seaman, but he'd lost his legs. Um, after being torpedoed and um, he'd ended up here and he was telling me about um, how pretty unbearable it was really because he, he said it was kind of like being buried alive oh, wow. uh, in this place he was, he was really fed up so I started um, taking weed with me and I went to see my grandfather and I'd get this guy and I'd, I'd give him some weed to smoke and um, he, uh, his, he, his entire demeanor changed. <laughs> right. But, but, but we'd have these conversations and um, about, about because I was saying, you know, well, it's not much better out there, you know. <laughs> I was like, I was saying, well, I'm, I'm on the outside of the place, you know, on the inside of the place, and we're, we're getting freaked out by the same kind of things. So it, it came from that, really. It came from these conversations that I was having with, uh, with Duncan, you know. Yeah. That's... yeah, and Tangier came up. Tangier came up because um, he'd been there as a merchant seaman quite a lot. He was telling me about it. Tangier it sounded very exotic, very exotic type of name for a very exotic place in Africa. Yeah. So um, that's where it came from, really. Okay. Now, Strange Times, uh, third album, released in '86. I think it has some of your uh, most memorable uh, tracks. Millions tracks on it. Of course, I have to mention Tears, which played at my best friend's funeral. Wow. Okay. 
Yeah. So, and that's what I when I when I talked to you earlier about that is the correlation and the, the parallel there. Uh, you lost your best friend yeah. at the age at the age of thirteen around yeah. this. Uh, well, I, when I, I, I got him when I was 13. I lost him when I was 21. Okay. Okay, so eight uh, years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. I got him when I was, I got, well, I, no, I wasn't, the, how old was I? I was younger, actually. I was about, about 11, I think. About 11. I was about 11 years old okay. when I got him. And um, he died. When I was 21. Okay. Okay. So like yeah. around 10, 11 years yeah. old. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, it's it's interesting, you know, because of I know my I had I had influenced my best friend um, with the chameleons, you know, playing them over and over. So it was it. I didn't know when when he passed away a few years ago that they were going to play that song, but um, it, yeah. it was really a pretty pretty profound um, uh, situation. Um, how did that um, help you or inspire you uh, to write tears? And how did that help? It, it, it gave me somewhere to channel the grief. <laughs> right. You know, I mean, it, gave, it was there. It was, in, there was in like an immediate kind of thing because um, I was I was working on the idea when I got the phone call, and against my my my. Uh, wishes really i was with the band when i really didn't want to be there because i knew that sam was sick and um we needed to go and, and they wouldn't let me go back and i said like i've got to go back to manchester and they were like no you can't because of this that and the other. um and then i got the phone call that it was it had gone um, and i was working on that idea then so it was an immediate um Remedy to be able to put my grief into yeah, channel that, channel yeah. that, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, dog, dogs are a special breed, literally. I mean, they, yeah. I think I don't, I don't think it. I think it doesn't really matter what it is. Mm -hmm. To be quite honest, you have a, you have a relation. You can have a, a, a deep relationship with any anything. Mm -hmm. I don't, I don't, I don't think it's just dogs. Right. I mean, I've had cats and felt the same. Mm -hmm. Like I've lost cats and had the same degree of grief. I've had, you know, pe you know, people. It, it, it really, it's, it's all about the connection. Right. You know, it's all about it's all about the connection that you make. The the the, the depth of connection is 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 the um this thing. Yeah. Well, uh, yeah. another track off of of uh, Strange Times. I'll remember. That's that's a gorgeous instrumental. Um, yeah. Are those are those muffled screams in the background? Yeah. yeah it's a, it's a, yeah it's it, it's the same one on a loop. Um, okay. it, 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 John screamed, screamed but he, John was recording something and he, he was <laughs> so I don't remember exactly what it was, but it's <laughs> John basically. It's John basically, and we just loops it. Uh -huh. uh, yeah. Wow, Look, it sounded like you had a lot of uh, interesting creative ideas coming from all different members. That's what I think. That's what made the band. You know, too. Well, I mean, yeah, the, the, I mean, he, the, the scream would like you take the scream as an example. It was on, on tape. He just done something, mm -hmm. and he screamed. It was on tape, and we heard it, and we just thought, "Oh, let's use it." I mean, mm -hmm. we, there was a lot of that. You know, we did that a lot. You know, we'd, we'd, we'd have spontaneous kind of things would happen, and we'd go, "Yeah, you know, why don't let's why don't we use that?" Yeah, you know, throw everything in. You know, try to make it as as tonally interesting as possible. Yeah, but I think it worked. And, and, oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. 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 Every case, I think it. I think it did work. We would take it out if it hadn't worked. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, it works. Um, yeah. No, I mean, I remember doing um, the big sessions when. We didn't want to pull too many tracks off the off the album, and the guy wanted another track for this twelve inch single he was putting out in Germany. So we just started with a drum machine, and we just kind of like I did something on the Casio, and then Dave did something on the Casio, and we just spent the afternoon just 
building it up. And one of the things that we did was we, we got a television set. We put a microphone on the television set and then we had Alistair switching channels every 20, every 20 seconds. Yeah? She had 20 seconds of this channel, 20 seconds of that channel, 20 seconds of this channel, back to that channel. You have like all these snippets of dialogue. I mean, then we just used to, and then we just dropped them in mm -hmm. um, during the track randomly. You know, we didn't know what it was going to get. We'd have it, we'd have a whole um, tape of dialogue with no idea what, what was on it. And then occasionally we'd just press the drop in and whatever we captured, we'd press it out again. And whatever we captured was, and that's the sort of thing that we used to like doing. We used to it started to be kind of really spontaneous and you know, not really know what's gonna happen, kind of deal. You, know, you know, Dave really rarely knew what he was gonna play until we was actually recording it. We wouldn't we wouldn't know what he was gonna play, and then he'd just play, you know, like I remember up with an escalator. Um I hadn't heard none of me and John went out on an errand and when we came back, he'd done it. We'd never heard that before. And yeah, right. he, he, yeah, yeah, he just like he used to like to have the backing track, but I'd just play over the backing track. And um, that's how he came up with a lot of his really best guitar lines. Um, and it was great because it kept everything fresh and spontaneous. We didn't know. But I mean, back then we were a band that we were quite happy. A few times we would actually play arrangements live that were even finished and we didn't even know what we were going to do. Um, really? <laughs> Person isn't safe anywhere these days was like that was one of those and one flesh was one of those where we just, we just didn't know what we were going to do we just we weren't any there weren't any words written mm -hmm. and we we just we just liked the idea and um, which is well I think you have to do something right you have to you've got to sing something you've got to do something you've got to play something so so just do it and I, I liked that about the band in those early days we lost that um, eventually but. I really, I, I like that. I like being in a band that was, um, I'm not afraid of improvising, you know. Right. Well, I noticed that with, with, with your lyrics too, and a lot of in concert, that you ad lib quite a bit, you know. You, yeah. you can't change up the lyrics, and um, so, you yeah. know, I'm sure there's, there's a lot of that that you, over the years you've thought, well, maybe this word might work better here or this, you know, what. what really? Yeah, absolutely yeah. right. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, Tony Fletcher walked on water. Yeah. Uh, now that's your last recordings from '87 before the breakup. Yeah. Um, yeah. Talk about what manager Tony Fletcher meant to you and the band. Um, he's one of the finest human beings I've ever met in my life. Um, you know, he, he's. His generosity and his thoughtfulness and his sensitivity, um, just on every level, every positive level you can say about human condition, he had it. Um, everybody who worked with him loved him. Everybody. Um, some of the big stars like George Benson and people like that would, wouldn't work with anyone else, who absolutely refused to work with anyone else. Mm -hmm. um, uh, a condition of them doing these big shows at Wembley and that was that Tony was mm -hmm. the man was the man in the middle and um which he was for great you know for a great many of them um a massive loss just uh, devastating I was devastated mm. yeah. yeah how did how did that affect the other other members pretty much the same we were all in shock really um I mean by that stage, I think Tony was the only was the gravitational center. I think I, I kind of knew when he died. I kind of thought, oh, this is it's all going to go now. And um, and yeah, it did. It kind of fractured, fell apart after that. But um, did we all felt the same way about him? Really? Uh, yeah. Well, speaking of um, tracks on there, that the, the four track. Um, is it any wonder in the healer or wonderful tracks, you know, and I, I frequently go back and listen to those, but you know, the one that I most, that I like the most denims and curls that, that is my favorite. And again, that's up there with, for me, second skin view from a hill denims and curls. 
Those are my three. And I can't decide, you know, on, on different days, I like one better than the other, but, you know, Denims and Curls, that song has it all as far as, you know, where I'm coming from, my, my uh, interest and my, my ears. Great production, uh, the soaring guitar, especially during the chorus, it's, it's give, gives you those goosebumps. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. And it's uh, the lyrics, I think, are some of the best. Uh, they cut to the core of most of all of us at one time or the, another. You know, it's painful to hear those, but it's liberating at the same time. You know, Thank like, you. Are, you, are you hiding in a bedroom? This is the one, you know, are you hiding in a bedroom singing away to someone else's tune? Great. You know, haven't we all, you know, at, at some time or another, and some of us still, I mean, um, always will be doing that. But, and then those who you see, you never see. Those who hear, you never hear. They're just the way they'll always be. And then you better run, little boy, run, little girl. Well, you know the lyrics, but, but that, that's like, wow, you know. I mean, it's, it's hard to hear that, but it's so true. You know, the foolish world will hold you down, screw your feet into the ground. And that's, that's for all time. I mean, that's, that's society, you know, in a nutshell. So yeah. that along with the, with the music, it, but then at the end, then turning despair into hope, when you, when you say, where in the world is the inspiration to say the things you're aching to say? And, and that operative word, they're aching. I, th I think that kind of, you know, tells the story of that song too. It's, it's an aching kind of song. And I think a lot of people, maybe it's too painful to, to listen to the, to the lyrics, but it's, it's a wonderful song. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, wrote, I, I, wrote, I wrote the whole thing on the guitar. Um, mm -hmm. And I, don't, I, I really only just started playing guitar. Um, I just started learning how to play chords on the guitar. Mm -hmm. um, so that was one of the first songs that I wrote on the guitar. Um, but it was never, it was, you know, it was never finished. There's a finished version of it on the Chameleon Vox EP. Um, I don't know if you've heard that, but we, yeah, actually, we actually, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I like that the best. I like that version the best of it. But yeah, I mean, they were just demos, really. So mm -hmm. there were demos for that for that fourth album that never got made. Yeah. Well, it yeah. did get made eventually, but that was a different record. But yeah. Um, yeah. They were just the first four that we got to, and right. um, the rest of them turned into the Riggs album. Right. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah, that's um, anyway. Yeah, I think I'm, I'm maybe in the minority there with uh, liking that song so much because I don't, I don't hear. No, it's very popular. Uh, it's a very popular song. With no, a lot of people like that tune. Okay. Yeah, I don't have yeah. Words. that as much as some of the tunes. I guess we talk about. Um, now moving ahead a little bit to um, the band reformed for 2001's "Why Call It Anything," um, and I happened to, along with my brother. We went to Manchester and saw saw a concert, saw uh, you know for for that for that tour, yeah. um, because we never thought you would be here. We never thought you would come to the states. We you had yeah. never come to come to Texas anyway. You know, yeah. so uh, we we went there thinking that might be the last time, and then you know here you are. Um, anyway, I'll just mention one song uh, all around. And, and the lines, why do you hold your silence for other people's sake? That's a great, yeah. that's a great line. And too many of us, I think, do that. Um, you know, we're afraid what other people will think. We want to be liked yeah. by everybody, yeah. you know, yeah. not, not speaking out. And then yeah. why do the joys within you always feed the doubt, you know? Yeah. Uh, another hard-hitting song, but, but very, very true. What are your what's your take take on that on that? I really love that song. I'm really happy about it. There's a lot of communities fan, fans on the forums hated it, but um, mm, interesting. I I really like it. I think it's a really great song. 
I mean, Reg, I remember Reg, you know, saying, oh, that's a killer, you know. Um, and it came, it was me and Dave that did that, actually. Uh, yeah. That's fun. Do you mind? Yeah, um, really happy, yeah. were, you, were you still thinking? Go ahead. No, I was just saying I'm really happy with it. Um, yeah. do, you mind, do you mind talking about a couple of your side projects, Sons of God and Invincible? Yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, Zima Junction. Uh, world on fire, uh, yeah. great lyrics. You're my salvation. I'm your salvation. That yeah. again, you know. I mean, how 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 better can you say it than that? You know, because that's that's what it's really about. You know, I've 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 felt that way for eons. Yeah. And and to hear someone sing about it, you know, wonderful. Thank you. Um, came together very quickly, and very organically, very fast. I wrote it in about ten minutes. Mm -hmm. uh, in response to some of the a lot of the mail I was getting from people mm -hmm. yeah, about you know how the music made them feel like it was a coat in the in a fucking world of shit. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, that's basically how that evolved. That's where it came. From. Yeah. Um, oh, I thought I'd see one up. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> what was that? Sorry. I thought I'd just gone see one up against Liverpool. Oh, okay. Okay. So what's what's the score right now? Two one. Two one. Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, happy new life, which I was happy to hear you play back at the private concert. Uh, right. this, this one to me sounds like it could have been a chameleon's track. Was was there any thought about that beforehand, or no? It sounds almost like um, a, like a chameleon. I think I, I, it adds its origins in something I was writing for the chameleons. Yeah, but um, we broke up before I could use it. Mm -hmm. um, something I was jamming with. I, I think I was jamming with Reg. And we never got, we never used it. And um, so after I'd left the chameleons and stuff, and I decided to use it. I decided to finish it. That's when it came back in your life. Yeah, I think it's very inspirational, positive. I think it's one of your most positive songs. Um, Banish the darkness from your days, and then of course the the line: learn how to laugh again, learn how to live again, yeah. learn how to love again. Wow! Yeah. And the sun's the sun's coming out. So, yeah, because you know, at the end so, of the day, as, as 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 heavy as grief is, you know, we've got to get on with it. We've got to get on with life, and and how do you do that? Um, you know, that's really how I cope with it. Really, you know, like honor honor them and, and and incorporate them, and and think about all of the you know the great things that somebody was in your life, and then take that forward you know mm -hmm. I, I think it's very therapeutic and cathartic you know i would i would also add there um I yeah and um invincible was, oh go ahead was, i was going to say this talk was maybe doing a version for it a single oh okay. um for, for you Craig. so i'm thinking about doing it okay um yeah. In, invincible. Mm. Uh, again, glad to hear you play my favorite true tracks from from the private concert. Only you could save me. I know that's your favorite, right? Yeah, yeah. But I give. Uh, well, actually, actually, no, it's not my favorite. Gethsemane is my favorite, but um, okay. I do enjoy playing. I, I love all that record. Really, I think it. I was really, really happy with it in the end. I mean, it was a like pulling teeth actually getting it together but um once it was finished and mixed i really liked it yeah i think i think eve did a great job on on guitar yeah um, it was a great guitar player it was a phenomenal guitar player yeah. but, i mean he's a different kind of guitar player in that you know you can't jam with eve you don't jam he right. doesn't jam he wants to sit down and write his parts he doesn't like you know you couldn't be like improvising is not Eve's thing. You, 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 couldn't, 
he couldn't be doing the song and then just say to Eve, right, just improvise something for them. He wouldn't know what the fuck to do. But sitting down and working out his parts, it's almost like, I don't know, it's almost orchestral the way that he does it. You know, mm-hmm. it's like somebody who's like thinking it's like they know exactly what they want. This guitar is going to have this kind of tone and this is what it's going to do. And then this guitar is going to be with it and this is going to have this tone and this is what this is going to do. And he works it all out meticulously, which is, um, you know, Really good, really uh, impressive. Yeah. Um, my favorite on there is, is "Think It's Going to Happen." That, that's my favorite. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and again, the the, I mean, a very personal song for you, I know. Um, it, I think I thought if I could hide, everything would be okay. You know, it's yeah. like we. How many of us feel like that too? See, your 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 lyrics and most. Most all of the, you know, side and chameleons songs are just they they cut cut deep. I mean, they they touch us personally. I think that's probably what uh, you probably get some feedback on that from from fans. But um, yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, yeah. He could, that's an understatement, really. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you know, I try not to think about it though because I don't want it to. I don't want that to be, you know, a factor when I'm writing. I don't want to feel like suddenly like that I've got to deliver on that every single time I write a lyric because it, it just becomes too much, you know. Right. I try not to. I, I wasn't thinking about it at the time. I was just being, you know, writing honestly what I wanted to say and um, or, or singing what I wanted to say. And I want that to continue, you know. I think I don't really want to have that in the form of force in my mind that, oh, well, so many people are like, relate personally to get some feel so many heavy time. I mean it's nice to be you know to get that but you know I don't want you know the next I want to if I want to write a fucking you know some people to leave her, yeah then I want to be able to do that without feeling like you know I'm I'm diminishing as a lyricist or whatever, you know. Well, I think I think um your your humanity comes out in, in your lyrics. And um, I, I think that's a that's a point where you um, you reach with a lot of a lot of people out there. It's just you know you're you know the frailties and the imperfections, but then also the the hope and the inspiration. You know, so I think I think. Well, like a, you know, like I said, they all come from the same place, and that's that feeling of intense alienation that I've had my whole life. That's where it all comes from. Mm-hmm. And I think I think a whole lot. A lot of us can can relate to that. We we feel yeah. that at least yeah, I, to, to, to to some extent. Yeah, you know. Yeah. Um, what about um? I'm going to talk a, a little bit about Sun in the Moon. Okay. Okay. Um, my favorite track, a picture of England, but of course it's a picture of America as well. You know. <laughs> you know. You know. And, in a lot of places, a lot of places, I'm sure. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, maybe yeah. more and more so these days. You know. Well, you know, Dan blows me, maybe. Oh, yeah. <laughs> All my bills are electronic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's uh, um, death of imagination. Um, is again is more and more profound every day. I go back to that that song. Um, I think it's the the title says it. I mean, maybe your your words were a little prophetic back when you know it was already happening before the sun and the moon. But but still, more and more these day these days, you know, people have just lost that. You know, we have too many little toys to play with, too many distractions. Um, you know, we we've lost we've lost that. I mean, can we ever get it back? You know. Imagination, you know. Yeah, what's the plan? Yeah, um, everything collapses. You have to start all over again. Yeah. I mean, you know. Um. I mean, I, 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 I when I play it now, I say just the age of internet caused the death of imagination. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's true. You know? I mean, too many distractions again. You know that. that you know, to, to fill our day, you know, we just, we, we have to have something going on all the time, you know, yeah. you know busyness, busyness. Um, yeah. 
what about uh, peace in our time? Again, words to live by. Again, just like you're my salvation, I'm your salvation. My conscience tells me what's right. My conscience tells me what's wrong. I follow no one. I leave myself. You know. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's that's where it's all about. You know. Yeah. Uh, you know. I mean, that's 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 my two cents anyway. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's on the money. Yeah, that's exactly what I'm saying. Yeah. yeah. You know, um, I mean, it's very, it's very, you know, I think the sun and the moon is probably the most plain, the least ambiguous lyrics I've ever turned in, really. The, mm -hmm. There's nothing, there's no ambiguity with it. You know, it's exactly what it says there it is. You know. Right, right. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think uh, too many people out there are looking for external, motivations or external entities guide them to lead them um, and i'm speaking of you know organized religion which i've uh i mean deny i deny you know i think uh, the in, inner spiritual person and who you are yes. is much more you know and that's where the real religion is you know there you go absolutely yeah. Yeah, i agree yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. um yeah. Let's talk a little bit about um, inspiration for your songs. Um, is there a time of day um, where the creative juices are flowing better than other times? Yeah, I mean, when when you're more more active, when I'm active, when I'm actually out active, and I'm 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 feeling that kind of power and that energy that's in the music, then obviously, um, you know. When I'm not doing that, then it becomes it becomes more difficult to to get to um, open those channels because you kind of get into a sleepwalking kind of you know. I mean, such is the conditioning on society these days is that you know you feel like you're on fucking value in any way. Right, right, yeah, true. Uh, uh, half the time, <laughs> you know, because you just sedated with all this right bullshit, you know, and whatnot. so right. you know breaking out of that is, is is difficult especially you know in a society that is so backward that you know they criminalize things like psilocybin and they'll criminalize things like marijuana mm -hmm. um when, but those 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 substances are really good for opening the channels and getting the mind going, getting the mind flowing, you know. So that, you know, especially in Texas. So yeah, right, right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, um, do you uh, do you find um, you need to step away from a situation? Like, can you write about the the, the pain and the struggle while you're going through through that, or do you need to like? step away from it to, to better write about it no you can do it but it might, might not make a whole lot of sense until later on when you look back on it mm -hmm. you know sometimes you'll like you'll write from a very instinctive place mm -hmm. and not really not really have a clear view of what you're trying to say yourself it just feels right you know the lyric feels right the the, the delivery feels right so it's right you know that's what you go from mm -hmm. but um not really understanding where it's coming from until you do get that different perspective on it and you look back on it say a year or whatever down the road and you can go oh exactly i know exactly what that's saying you know i know exactly what where that's coming from so sometimes you know you don't need, no you can write it while you're going through it but you need the dip you know the shift of expense ex, uh, ex, uh, you need a, a shift of perspective in order to try to you know in order to actually understand it yourself really mm -hmm. i got that I understand that um well, how, do you, how do you approach the uh, the recording process are you a bit of a perfectionist when it comes to recording not at all no i'm not actually you know if it if it sounds right and feels right to me that's good enough you know i don't really care about how much compression there is in the hi-hat you know what i mean i just uh if I'm feeling it, if I'm feeling it, that's all that matters. I have worked with perfection, so we need this one. Um, 
you know, he's a, he was a meticulous perfectionist. Um, I'm not like that at all. No, no. I could just as easily release something off a cassette than, mm -hmm. than, than something I could actually get any feeling from it. In fact, yeah. I have done, you know, I have done, I've taken, I've, I've run vocals off cassette, off uh, multi track cassette takes because it's, felt, I feel better. It, you know, I've got more feel in that vocal than the one I'm actually trying to do. I've done it in the past. Yeah. yeah. Well, well I, I've, I've interviewed a couple of um, musicians and they were recording back in the late 60s, early 70s. But both of the, uh, the, uh, the engineers uh, and the, the producer that they worked with uh, didn't tell them they were recording it. It's just okay, guys. Go ahead and do a, a run through, you know. Yeah, yeah. And, and then and then after they did, thinking it was just a practice run. Okay, yeah. that's that's a take. I thought that yeah. was kind of interesting. You didn't have time to yeah. get nervous, you know. They said they just they just ran it through. I I try I ask my my um, guys when I'm when I'm working to record everything from 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 the start. Record everything because mm -hmm. I do a lot of improvisation on 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 that on recordings as well. And I, I don't want to do something and then forget that, you know, like it and then forget about it. So I, I try and get them to record everything and then I'll compile. Yeah. Right, right. Well, I think because you can overthink something, don't you think? Yeah. 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 I, don't, I don't write a set of lyrics and then, and then deliver the set of lyrics on them. I don't work that way. I have, I have lines and odd things and stuff, but a lot of it is done um, on the microphone. Mm -hmm. Wow. Wow. What's, what's the score now? Uh, it's half time. Okay. Um, do you still uh, you still get nervous before going on stage or, or performing? Um, I get angsty. Mm -hmm. uh, I just want to, you know, the waiting around, I get angsty, but I'm not nervous when I walk out. As soon as I put my guitar on, I'm, I'm comfortable. Mm -hmm. I don't. I don't. Um, although I haven't, I haven't said that, I've had quite a long time away from it now with the band, so I don't know what it's going to be like. We'll have to see. But um, no, normally not. Yeah. Really. Just, no. just amount, just amount enough tension to be healthy. Just that healthy amount of tension, you know. Right. I can. I can. I can understand that. Because if yeah. you went out there with none, then it would be like you got. You got to have something kind of uh, driving, getting those juices. Yeah, the adrenaline's got to be going. You know what I mean? <laughs> right. <laughs> or you're just going through the motions. Yeah, unless, you, unless you're taking fake, you know, unless you, you know, doing drugs or something. But <laughs> I don't. I I don't do drugs anymore. So. Um, what about? Can you recall the the gig that you played with the fewest people attending? No. Or one of them. One of them. Um, yeah, we, we we played we played uh, this this reggae club in Bradford, and we we walked out to play the show. It was about thirty five people in the room, uh -huh. and we kind of were a bit confused, but then. It was explained to us that people who a lot of people wanted to come see us, but they were too scared to go to this place. Oh, okay. I think, it's called the Palm, I think it was called the Palm Grove in Bradford. Mm -hmm. And uh, it turned out to be one of the best sets of the tour that we did. It was a really great place. Yeah. yeah. It's interesting. All the, all the rasters that ran it actually. Well, one of them was the space guy. He comes up to me and goes, "Oh, come with me." And I thought I was going to get. I thought I was going to get. Oh, oh, wow. Okay. And I, I followed him, and I'm like, I'm getting really tense, ready, ready to start fighting. And uh, he takes me to this room, and it's just a base bins all around the room, mm. and um, it gave, gave me a, a joint of sensimilia, massive conical, like a Caribbean chemical. So it sends me and he gives me that and lights it. He goes, oh, he says, that was he says that was fucking great, man. I loved I loved your set. I loved it. Uh, he says, uh, 
we're going to listen to some tunes in here with me. So I'm sitting there with this giant raster, <laughs> giant, <laughs> this giant raster smoking, smoking this weed with him. And um, nobody knew where I was because it was like a secret room. <laughs> <laughs> they, couldn't, they couldn't find me. But they was, yeah, they were saying to me, that people are too scared to go there. They were, they were too scared. I don't know why. Wow. Okay. Uh, I mean, it was. It did. It did. It, the area was a bit intimidating, and the place was a little bit intimidating. To be honest, I thought. I thought I was being led off. So mm -hmm. they were going to give me a good idea or something. <laughs> but uh, it turned out to be like one of the best experiences. So. It's not really about the number of people um, right. Right. anymore for me. I mean, obviously, it can be a bit demoralizing for bands, but. Um, for me, it's not about that anymore. I don't think I've got anything really to prove to anybody. I used to feel like, you know, we had something to prove, but I don't really believe that anymore. So it's not about, I don't care how many people I'm playing to, really. Right. As long as um, I can make a, an impact, you know. Right. And on the tour that you saw me on recently, that's been the case. That You know, I've been playing to small gatherings of people, but... The, the effect has been profound and uh, mm -hmm. as, long as, I, as long as I can see that happening, I don't, you know, I don't care. You know. yeah. I've had people like, I had people like literally pointing out on the setting mm -hmm. uh, after, after those shows. So I don't really care how many other people get it or don't get it anymore. I really yeah. don't. Well, I think, I think it was effective. Uh, it was it was a more intimate surrounding, you know, when you when you have fewer people like that, and you do an acoustic set. And yeah, well, I, I think that's going to be a paradigm anyway. I mean, not to that extent. That's an extreme thing, you know. Playing, you know, going to play to thirty people from whatever. But um, I do think that a new paradigm is in order here, and I think that people need to. You know, I've seen a lot of complaining recently about the cost of tickets for these stadium gigs. Oh my God, yeah, I know, I know. Why does Paul McCartney need to do a stadium gig? Why? Mm. Why do right. we need to do that? Right. Because I'd pay $100 to see Paul McCartney mm. in, a, in a smaller room. Right. I might even pay 300 if it was in a room with Couple of hundred people. <laughs> right. You know what I mean? Yeah. So yeah. Like we, we need it needs a new paradigm, really. Right. And I think you know who who wants to go to in the middle of those massive crowds. No. I mean, no. Um, I'm I'm playing a festival um, in a couple of weeks, but I don't enjoy festivals. I wouldn't I wouldn't go. To, I don't even think I've got a glass of green. That's the best festival. That's the best festival I've ever been to. I don't even think I do that anymore. Mm -hmm. I mean, I just don't. You know, and I think the industry, uh, uh, you know, is a lot in a lot of trouble. Sure, um, but that might not necessarily be a bad thing, because you know, venues and agents have monopolized this business for too long. Right. You know, right. We need to get to a point where, you know, it doesn't matter how big you are. You know, play two or three nights in a small place. Do you know what I mean? Right. In these huge fucking stadium tours. Well, well, one thing, one thing that it's all about, that's, that's, that's all. It can only be about money. That can right. only be about money. Right. It right. can only be. And how much money do does someone like you know Mick Jagger or Paul McCartney? How much money do they fucking need? Do they really need? Right. Right. How much do they need? No. Right? no. Why, does Paul, why does Paul McCartney need mm -hmm. to play? football stadiums at uh, that kind of cost because obviously the production of those shows mm -hmm. is a lot yeah i understand that and and, yeah. and logistics production costs and logistics have all spiraled through the stratosphere because of the war and covid yeah 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 blah 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 that's all true but why does he need to do it why does he need to play in front of you know oh, because so many people want to see him play live well right well See that 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 brings that brings uh, another uh, uh, interesting subject. The rise, that was what uh, it... right? The the rise the rise of um, tribute bands. 
Yeah. Um, yeah, it's just, it's rampant. I mean, it's like, uh, because they can't see this band, maybe they, they tour the, the actual band every four or five years or what have you. They want, these fans want to see them more often. You know? I, think so, so get, I think that's fine. I saw the, I, I saw yeah. the analogs do the White Album. Have you seen that? Mm -hmm. No. Uh -uh. The, the analogs perform the White Album from start to finish live. Okay. No, is that on YouTube? Eight. Is that on yeah. YouTube? Okay. Yeah. Well, the analog from Holland. Okay. And um, they 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 did they do a few things, but the um, the best one I've seen was when they did the White Album from start to finish in order, in you know, the okay. whole album. Okay. And it, it's it's incredible mm -hmm. what they do. It's incredible. The Beatles couldn't have done it. <laughs> As well. No, they couldn't. <laughs> the Beatles couldn't have done that. Yeah. That's yeah. There's that hunger, I guess, from the fans, you know, that they just have to go to concert. They have to go out there, and even if it's not the real band, if it's if it's a tribute band, you know, and they sound just like them, they 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 yeah. they have that 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 overwhelming need to go go out there. Yeah, it's good. I think that's good. But you know, a new paradigm is in order because you know you are going to be paying more for your tickets now, and um. As far as those huge, as far as the tradition, the traditional old way of going about things, you know, like sleeper buses and, and fucking, <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know, the whole rock and roll, high, high octane rock and roll kind of thing, um, is it's over. It's over. I think so. I think so. Well, going back to the acoustic uh, tour that you did, I think one thing that, that we got, I got from that. Was was again the the intimacy, and it, when you play a large concert, you can't talk to the audience like that and take questions, and you know sit no. up on a you know. So that's something no. that's very that was special special. Yeah, that's why I love doing it. Yeah, and it's a very it's very very uncomplicated, and right. you know it was just me and Stephen in my car. Mm -hmm. That was it. Yeah, no tour buses, no vans, no PA's, no. You know, logistics, no, you know, just me and Stephen, I gear in the back of the car, bam, done. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, you know, and people, you need, you do, yeah, and you need to pay a little bit more for that experience, but that's what's special about it, right? Right. Right. right? I agree. I agree. What, uh, what was your, uh, um, how did you feel about the, 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 the whole tour? Was it, um, did you enjoy oh, it? It's, yeah. It's the most enjoyable tour I've ever done in my life. Oh, that's great. That's great to hear. Um, and, you know, on, on, a, on a number of levels, it was the most, most personally satisfying. It's the most personally rewarding tour I've ever done. It was, I know, on every level, it was the best thing I've ever done. Yeah. I'd like to do more of it. Yeah. Well, yeah. well, that would, you know. Because, because taking the band out on tour is nothing yeah. but, right. but stress. Stress, 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 stress. So I've, heard, I've heard that. I've heard that many, many times. Yeah. What oh, yeah. uh what what was the strangest, oddest place that you you've ever heard your music being played? That you walked into or you went somewhere and you and you heard some some chameleons being played. Can you can you think? A grocery store? <laughs> no, I don't no. think no. But no, well, I know. Don't even need to play music in the grocery store anymore, do you? Right. Not, not um, a lot. Not a lot of them. Oh, I'll tell you what it was. Watching Top Gear. Uh-huh. Ah, okay. Well, the show Top Gear, the old the, the Jeremy Clarkson. Did you ever get that in America? They watched no. that in America. No. Uh, Jeremy Clarkson, the, the, the three guys that do a car show. Mm -hmm. right? It's all about cars. The show it's called Top Gear, and they were doing a sequence where they took three sports cars and drove them through northern Italy. Okay, you know, and, out and, all that. and I'm just watching Top Gear because I don't know why I watched it really. I thought because Clarkson's a dick, and but it's quite funny, it's quite funny sometimes. Mm -hmm. I was watching Top Gear, just I did, I'm casually watching Top Gear, and as they're driving through the out, second scene came on. <laughs> Second skin as they were driving through the Alps. Really? So that was, yeah, that's the most unusual context that I've ever heard of it. 
Well, that's something. I, I wonder who the producers maybe were behind that or or what. Yeah, like, definitely were. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Wow. That's a good yeah, that would, as well. That would shock me myself if I watched the show and, and heard that. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Um, what about the uh, the strangest place that you've run into a fan? Outside Bon Supermarket, I think. Um, although it happened to me in um, in in, in um, um, what's it called? The supermarket here. Kroger. 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 Yeah. Buying Kroger. mushrooms and I'm buying mushrooms and Krogers, and someone came up up to me, and uh, we recognised him from the yeah, right. yeah. He started yeah. talking to me in the store. <laughs> um, I've had really weird. I had somebody. Uh, I was watching a buster one night in a harbour in Cornwall in the evening. I was I was in the fishing harbour and uh, beautiful quaint Cornish fishing village, and I'm watching a busker and that somebody somebody behind me goes. So this is how you spend all your royalties, is it? And I turn around and <laughs> everybody's face. Everybody's face was just impassive and I had no idea who said it. And then I never found out. Yeah, whoever it was never cracked, it never broke. <laughs> oh wow. Um, I've had people, I've had hair hostesses come to me on airplanes and crouch down next to me and go, Oh, are you Mark Burgess from the Chameleons? Mm -hmm. and, uh, so yeah, that's kind of weird places. Yeah, yeah. Wow, Kroger. <laughs> um, Kroger. Uh, and that was that you that was the edible mushrooms, not the psychedelic. Um, oh, that was <laughs> yeah, so, <laughs> unfortunately, <laughs> unfortunately, Kroger don't sell psilocybin mushrooms quite yet. Quite yet. Not, not quite yet. Well, I think I think you've got to go to Denver for that. Right. <laughs> uh, um I'm sure, and we mentioned this earlier, you're well aware of the profound impact that you and your music has had on many a fan throughout the years. Uh, yeah, that's got to yeah, be a really it's impossible, rewarding. It's impossible not to be on it. Yeah, it is. Um, sometimes it can be, you know, a bit hard to deal with because it's very emotional. But um, oh, no, it is. It's, 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 it's extremely rewarding and vindicating, especially when you're in a band that the industry seems to treat as worthless, you know, which is pretty much my experience in the communities has been that the, the established industry just don't even think see us as being significant, you know. Right. So so to have that kind of reaction, yeah, it's 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 vindicating really. You know, it's the you know what and you know this, it's the fan that matters. It's not yeah, the, it's not the critics, it's not the you know, because I found that what I if I hear if I hear the industry has overlooked a band, I want to I want to search that band out. You know they yeah. they've got to have some because um, the, the the industry. Well, I, I, I regard the industry as worthless, so it's a mutual right. It's a kind of mutual feeling. They they regarded chameleons as worthless. Right. I think they were. I think the music industry is worthless. Right. I think it's worthless. You don't need it. You right. don't need it. Uh huh. Yeah. You don't need it. No, no. It's up to the individual. That, and, the, and they're, becoming, they're becoming more superficially. So they're becoming more superfluous. Right. Every every year. Every year. Every day. Yeah. Every, yeah. Yeah. I yeah. think you're right. What um what was I gonna say? Because oh, my experience, I remember hearing um I think it was a local radio show, rock and roll alternative, George Gamark. On a Sunday night, he had this slot, maybe a couple of hours every Sunday night, and that's where I would hear the latest alternative. And this was back in '83. Yeah, it was the same year, same year. And a lot of lot of import stuff coming from from the UK. Uh, he would get the singles and and play them. And I heard, um, I think it was as high as you can go. I think that's what he played. I think that's what. Uh -huh. he, and um, I was hooked just from hearing that and i had to find the album and once i did love everything again on it it was just uh it was totally different i know i know you've heard this before but your sound 
was totally different than what had ever come before that. Um, and um, it, there was nothing really to compare it to, you know. Um, it was very innovative. Uh, it was it was melodic. Um, the guitar, you know, that echoey guitar, the treated guitar there. And then, of course, your lyrics, you know, was other other bands had were were more primitive. Let's put it that way. You, you guys were had a very polished kind of sound, even at that first album, I think. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, we've been we've all we've all been listening to some records most of our lives. We all so you know we we kind of we had a good instinct for for melody and tunes and stuff. We didn't want to sound like anything. Any if any if we came up with something that reminded us of something that was going on at that time, we'd throw it away. But we wouldn't do it. Right. You know, we just oh, uh, imagine we could say fix loads or whatever, and we just say right, we don't, don't we're not going to do that then, and. Right. Uh, so we went against that, you know. Um, we didn't want to sound like anybody else, right. uh, but but by the same token, you know, we did. Um, you know, there was an element of the of the Liverpool scene, and there was an element of you know, the Edge with his when he started playing through a, a five hundred one, sure. Roland five hundred one. Um, those influences do creep in, you know. You know, they, they, they do they do help you colour what you're doing. Because I mean, up until that, you know, up until our first Peel session, our guitar band was very heavily flanged. There was a lot of flanger on it um, mm -hmm. until we got a 501 chorus echo, and then that changed the guitar sound. So, and that was working with Lily White. Oh yes, Steve. Yeah. yeah. So. Yeah, but yeah, we 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 didn't want to sound like you know we we would we would purposely avoid anything that we came up with that reminded us remotely of anything else that was going on around us. Mm -hmm. yeah. we, we wanted to do our own thing. That's why that's why being with we're, we're a Manchester band that wasn't part of the fucking factory thing or anything like that because we didn't want to be that. Right, <laughs> you know, right. we didn't well, want to sound like them. Yeah. I'm glad you and many fans are glad you didn't go that direction. That's for sure. Yeah, but it just made it tougher for, to get exposure because, um, you know, music press and stuff. You you know, you, it, life becomes a lot easier if you get them on your side. You know? Right. Well, we 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 never did, so it was always a struggle. Yeah. To, you know, yeah. Well, uh, like you said, you know, some kind sometimes being um, different. Can be like a curse because um you know you you always you have the fans and the critics out there that want to compare you to somebody they want to say well it sounds like so and so uh it sounds like you do there, there, that, that's a cop out there's too many just because the the guitar is a little treated it's echoey oh it sounds like you too you know yeah. you guys never sound like you too you know um so yeah. There, there's always that, um, oh, you have to give them a point of reference, you know, and when you're trying to turn somebody onto a band, well, they sound like, you know, yeah, well, yeah. you know, just listen, just, just listen to the, to the, to the album and then you make your own assessment, you know, yeah. I think that's a little lazy attitude for a lot of people too, you know, as well, yeah. but um, I was going to ask you, um, what bands and music are you listening to these days? I'm still listening to the same stuff I always listen to, to be quite honest. Um, um, any any new bands that you that you like? Not really. Not, not really. really. No. Yeah. I can't think of any anything that I've heard that's contemporary at the moment that's set my my world yeah. on fire. <laughs> um, and at those moments, I'm, I'm, I am, I'm, I'm, I'm listening to fucking early Ice Cooper right now. And, you know, um, I'm the same. Mark, I'm the same way. I mean, I've got a huge collection. I've got hundreds, thousands of CDs and albums, and I don't find anything contemporary, like you said, that really just turns me on. You know, I'm very I jaded. Try. I'm very jaded about the, the the current music, and yeah. and like you said, the industry. Yeah. So I go back to the old stuff. No, I don't. I don't. I mean, um, 
Who did I see the other night who opened for Roxy Music? Mm-hmm. It was called St. Vincent. Okay. St. Vincent, do you know that? I've heard, I've heard of, but I haven't heard she anything. Opened, she opened for uh, Roxy Music in uh, Dallas. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, I re and that was good. I enjoyed that live, so I might see Cat Records. Usually I have to see a band live before I get excited by the records. Okay, okay. Very rarely do I hear a band, um, um, very rarely do I hear a record before I, you know, I get excited by the record and see mm -hmm. the band. Mm -hmm. I like to see the band live. Right. Yeah. Before you I don't get out that much these days. So. Right. Um, uh, yeah. A lot of the, I mean, most of the interviews I've done, you know, go. I'll send you the link again to my, the interview site, are, are old, old guys, you know, um, in their 70s and stuff, you know. Um, the one thing, they're, they're open to do the interviews, you know, they're, they're not like, um, well, who is this guy, you know, I don't know him, uh, that seems real amateurish, I'll only do an interview with some reputable, you know, like, you know, magazine or somebody I've heard of before, so there's none of that. Well, these, these guys, you know, are, are open to do that, you know, and um, yeah. it's been a real re rewarding experience for me. But again, it's a lot of those, you know, older guys, you know. Yeah. Well, we remember, you know, fanzines and things like that, don't we? So you're right, right. No, I mean, there's nothing kind of. Nothing really that Gab gives me going on. None, none, none of it. I can't relate to any of it really. Right. Uh, I don't relate to what they sing about, and I don't relate to how they sound, and I don't relate to where they come from. Okay, <laughs> completely cut off from it. Coming really, really <laughs> alienated by it. Right. Right. Yeah. I've, I've become very jaded. Doesn't say, doesn't say anything to me. Right. Right. Most of it, most of it yeah. you know, and a lot of the music comes my way, tends to be kind of like, you know, second hand goss music. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Never liked it, really. Oh, and, and just the influx of speed metal and, and all that heavy metal stuff. It's like, no. I mean, can, can we, can we, you know, why do we have to need another band like that? I don't, I don't, you know, that, that I don't. Stuff, I, don't. You know. I just listen to Motorhead and go, that's it. <laughs> You know, that's right. it. That's the only. That's it. They, right. they, they did it. They did it. Yeah. 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 So no, no interest. Right. Well, um, I like to. I like to hear. I'd like to hear some new new things that kind of blow me away. But it's been mm -hmm. ten years since. It's been ten years since I had since I had a, you know I came across a band's record. And, and went gaga over it. Oh, the last, last time it happened to me was with uh, Girls Names from Ireland. I heard their record and thought, oh, it's absolutely brilliant. It did nothing. The record did nothing. Right. Yeah. So, like, what's the point now? Right. I don't, I don't know. Somebody gives me music, I'll listen to it. And if, if, I, if I like it, then I'll, you know. But it's rare. It's rare that I like something that I quite like, but it's rare that I go. I have to buy this record immediately. It's, you know, that never happens. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, no, I'm not in the same way. What, um, what about what keeps you busy these days besides music? Then, um, well, just trying to make this happen is a full time job. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, for the last, you know, since since that came off, I came off the acoustic tour. All I've been doing. It's, it's trying to make this band, these band shows happen because we got the, the mission tour cancelled. Right. Um, but the rest of the time, I mean, I'm doing my, I'm just, I'm just doing my own thing, really. I'm just doing my own thing, and that's the one thing that I'm grateful for. For this music's giving me the freedom to be able to do what the fuck I want. <laughs> so, um, I just, you know, I take my dogs for walks and read books and and watch movies and and. Um, Play, play my guitar or, you know, play my bass or just whatever I want, whatever I feel like doing. Yeah. Well, talk about, talk about the upcoming tour. 
Uh, how did how did that all get get started? What what were what's what's what happened behind the scenes there to 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 hook you up with that that tour? Is that one of your dogs? Or? Yeah. <laughs> <Hold on. laughs> yeah. I'm not chasing you around. It's got it's got it's got, it's got a, a, a cuddly sheep in his mouth and he's running around. Um, sorry, what was the question? Oh yeah, how how did uh, uh, this this tour come come to be? What was what was the uh, details leading up to that? How did you how did you secure the the, the gig? Um, uh, well, we're supposed to do this tour with the mission, and it got postponed till next year. Oh. Signed a, a CD release. We had a, a recording that we'd made during lockdown, coming okay. out on Metrop Metropolis Records, and uh, I timed the release for this tour, and then this tour didn't happen, and I was going out the wall because it was none of it was our fault. We were already kind of you know, and, and so the agent to placate me. Because she was saying, well, we want you to, you know, we want you to commit to doing the mission until next year. We'll postpone it. For, and I said to her, I, I don't even think, I don't know if we can, if we can commit to it. You know, I don't know if we can do that. And she was desperate for us to agree to this postponement thing. So she said, well, if you if you agree to that, I'll get you some dates, um, you know, to as a substitute, so you can still come out and play some shows. So that's how it started, and she got us on this uh, the support. She got us opening for um, she wants revenge on the east coast, and um, and then there was the substance festival in LA. She was like, these were all things that came in, and uh, so I agreed to do it. But it, it's been the most stressful exercise I can ever remember, like getting it together because. The industry is just fox, basically, and the the the, the cost of like, logistics is through, through the stratosphere. Mm -hmm. So I'm having to put a lot of my own money into this, and I'm no guarantee that I'm going to get it back. And I'm like, it's very stressful, but we'll see what happens. See what happens. Well, I looked on the on the website just uh, yesterday, day before in Fort Worth, and they didn't even have you listed. No, no. yeah, yeah. I've, yeah this is a kind of, that's the kind of agent I've got. Okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Interesting. Well, who are the uh, who are the band members that that you're going to be playing with? Well, it's going to be me and Stephen and whoever I can get. Basically, every time I try and get the band over here, I get hurdles thrown in the path that are just okay. some of them are surmountable, some of them aren't. Yeah. Uh, I'm really disappointed. I'm really disappointed about it. You know, I, I'm, mm -hmm. but I'm not in a position to be able to cancel it. So. Yeah, I know I you were... carry on. So he, I've got Justin Lomery who played with me in 2019. So he's going to come up for edge. Right. right. Yeah, I know. That's I know you were working really hard for that. Um, well, it starts uh, what next? Is it next next week? When is it next next Sunday? When is it? Or next Saturday? Yeah, next week. Yeah, fifteen. Uh, okay. Um, I think it's Lola's. It's called in Dallas. Okay, okay. I'll I'll look I'll look that up and see. And uh, well, what's the score now? I think it's going to be two up. So we need I need Liverpool I need Liverpool to equalise now. We need we need this to be a draw. <laughs> okay. Yeah. yeah. If, if this day's a draw, my my team stay up. But if Everton if uh, Arsenal win. Oh, They'll okay. go above us by um, by one point. You you haven't um, since you've been since you've been here. You haven't uh, uh, taken an interest in um, American sports, have you? No. Okay. Well, don't. No. <laughs> Sorry. There's only one team sport for me. That's that's football. Football, right? Right. Yeah. Well, yeah. it's good. It's good. You get the the picture. You get to watch, you get to watch it. Yeah, yeah, oh yeah, yeah. yeah. I'll, I'll find a way. Right, right. <laughs> you found a way. Um, yeah, well, I, uh, yeah. Can you can you think of anything else, um, Mark, that you'd like to add or? or... Um, no, but I have to. I have to go now. So right, um, right. Yeah, unfortunately, I'm out of time. Let, real quick, let me ask you about your uh, dogs. Uh, what kind of dogs do you have? Um. More thing he heard squeaking on the toy there. He's a limping. Okay. Um, and Ricky, and 
he's, he's kind of my, my dog. He's a, a, a Pomeranian cross with an American Eskimo. Oh, okay, that's interesting. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and they don't. Um, and Marty. <laughs> 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 so they don't want to. They don't want to do a cameo. I'm sure. They're outside now. She's took him outside because he's really the. Yeah, Morty was getting a bit restless, so she's been <laughs> taking it. She's out. They're out in the yard at the moment. Okay. But you and you got the vaccinations coming up. Yeah. 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 So so done. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, are you having some allergies nowadays, or are you were sneezing? Um, yeah, I have an, an allergy to um, Arsenal winning. <laughs> oh, that's what it is. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, my my wife starts sneezing when I walk in the room, so she she always she's allergic to me. So uh, I've had that feeling for a long time, anyway. So um, all right, well, um, I appreciate it, appreciate it, Mark. You know, spending time on this with me and uh, you know visiting and going going back down that uh, memory memory lane. Appreciate that, and best of luck. On this tour, I know it's a pain and struggle, but I hope I hope it hope it works out. Once once we're underway, I'm sure it'll be fine. But yeah, there's lots of going on. Right, right. Well, it's a lot. Shouldn't be a, that way, really. Isn't it? It's a pretty long yeah. tour. How many how many dates? It's a pretty pretty long tour. Sure. Okay. Um, we're out from the 15th of October to the 18th of November. It's about a month. Okay. Okay. All right. Well, again, um, thank you for your time, Mark. Thank you. you know, always the best, best of everything for you, and um, keep pressing on. You know, keep doing what you're doing, and um, appreciate it. And um, thank I'll, you. I'll, I'll, I'll let you know once I have this edited and and it's it's live. I'll let you. I'll let you. Know. Thank you very much. Mate. I appreciate it. Nice talking to you. Nice talking to you, Mark. Bye. 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 Bye.